First, I wanna like know a little bit about your background. So, do you remember when you heard like heavier music for the first time? Heavy, heavy music for the first yeah. time? Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, I got into Kiss, and I thought that Kiss was the only band that existed. So I didn't know much about music, all, but I was very young. I was like two two years old, and my cousin introduced me to Kiss, and then from Kiss. Um, my neighbor across the street, who was a little older than me, he had Ozzy Osbourne and, Metall and Metallica tapes. And I, he let me borrow them, and I was like, wow, there, there are more artists, you know, than, you know, than just Kiss. So um, I got into Ozzy, and then Metallica, and then from Metallica, it just got heavier and heavier and heavier. All the bands I found out about death. Um, then I just started getting interested in, in obscure bands just because they were obscure. And I thought, this is cool to find obscure music that no, nobody that I know listens to. So I started listening to Cancer and Malevolent Creation and then it just got heavier and heavier. And at the same time I was into rock and roll and I was doing that just as much. So what was like in heavier music that sort of like made you very in love with it? That made me what? I'm sorry? What made you fell in love with it? Um, Death was the first band. What was it about the music? Yeah. Just, I liked, I liked the riffs. I, start, I wanted to play guitar. I started playing guitar when I was seven and eight, somewhere around there. And Metallica, James Hetfield, and you know, all those great guitar players, I, I, I knew very early on that I was gonna have to really like work hard on playing guitar to, to try to do what those guys do, you know. So Chuck Schuldiner and James Hetfield and you know um, Dave Mustaine and like all those guitar players, I, I wanted to play like them. So I took lessons, and then the more the better I got at it, the more. I was able to start learning how to write my own songs and write my own riffs and I wanted it I liked all different kinds of music by that point because my mom would play like ABBA song like ABBA Saturday Night Fever and all that stuff and um, and then there was the other side where I liked heavier stuff so just playing guitar and um, trying to get better and better and better at it and then the next step, step after that was learning how to write my own songs. So what made you pick up a microphone and become a singer? Well, out of necessity, because when my first band started, we, have, we had a singer, and he was kind of a, a friend, and he kind of just showed up with the deal, and because um, we had a guitar player that, they came as a package. The guitar player and the singer came as a package deal. Okay. But the singer couldn't sing. So we were going for a couple years with him, and then um, we fired him because of his attitude, and also because we didn't think he was that good of a singer. And then I said, "Let me try," and I started singing for that band, which was called, which is called This End Up. And it didn't sound—I didn't sound any better, you know. I wasn't, I wasn't a singer either. So just out of necessity of not being able to find a singer in in Westchester, Pennsylvania, I kind of had to just start practicing that as well. And then um, after I did it, like I, I did a little three song demo with my band, with me singing, and it was terrible. And then when we did the next one a year later, I started to sound more comfortable. And then the more demos that I did, the the better my voice got. But then when CKY did a, a demo called Oil, it was the Oil demo, people call it the Gold Tape. Um, we did seven songs in um, Conshohocken, in Pennsylvania with the Butcher Brothers. Um, they weren't there, but we did it in Studio 4 in Conshohocken, and I tr we tried to do alternative rock, and it was a disaster because I wasn't into alternative rock. I liked hard rock, like, um, you know, like the, there were the bands that I liked, and then there was metal. And at that time, those kinds of that kind of music with guitar playing, where where instruments were the focal point of music, was starting to die because of the Seattle thing. So I tried to emulate it by by starting 
a band that sounded like that and it didn't work and those songs a lot of people like that tape how it turned out but I think it's the worst thing I've ever done and um, we tried to use it to get signed and it didn't work my voice was terrible and when you're not when you're not in if your heart's not in what you do what you're doing musically it's going to show people are going to know so that's when I decided screw it I'm just going to do what I want to do and that's how CKY turned out the way we turned out so, did it take you like a long time to figure out the right technique for the singing so that you wouldn't lose your voice all the time? Um, I never really had that issue. I just jumped in. Um, there were times when I've lost my voice uh, for over the last 25 years of touring or whatever, but it was never like a big issue. Um, I, just, I think just from singing in the car and just singing all the time by myself, to myself, you know, I just developed a strong you know, whatever that muscle is that, that makes you, uh, your voice not fall apart. But the, on this tour, the second, after the second show, my voice was shot. And I thought that was strange because my, my voice doesn't usually get shot like that. So we went out to the, the pharmacy and I found this mouth spray still in my bag right there. And um, miraculously, is miraculously a word? Um, <laughs> as a miracle, it cleared up my voice, and I haven't had a voice problem since. Okay. In 20, 20 shows that we've done nonstop every day. I was actually going to ask you that you jumped from a CKY tour from to 96 Bitter Beings tour. No, to ah, sorry, sorry, 96 yeah, yeah. Bitter Beings tour from to doing a death metal vocal. Like, yeah. So. How was the transition and, and, and how was it for the vocals to do something like totally different? Well, I do I practice a lot of death metal vocals in the car, like I said, because I can't practice them in my house. Because people call the police and stuff like that. So when I'm whenever I'm driving somewhere I I put music up really loud and I I scream along with it and I know all I know all these songs, so um it it just it was gonna be a challenge to stay on tour for seven eight weeks but you know i had to do it because I, I you know it's it's a once in a lifetime thing to tour this long because i don't i'm not much of a traveler so it was out of my comfort zone to go on tour with 96 bitter beings for a month and then come on this tour and i wanted to challenge myself i wanted to say get out of your comfort zone just do it and right after that tour ended i flew to florida um, we we went to Josh's apartment, our the malevolent creation bass player, and all of us just rehearsed for about an hour and a half, maybe two hours, on an electronic drum kit, really small amp, and um, there was no microphone. I just sang over the rehearsal. Okay. <laughs> and um, we, you know, I was nervous. Phil was nervous. The whole band was nervous. Like. Is Darren going to be able to pull this off? You know, are we going to be able to, am I going to, I, I thought, am I going to be able to pull this off? And then we did the first show as a festival. Shit in my pants, you know. <laughs> first show in front of, you know, 5,000 people and we nailed it. And because if you know a song and another person knows a song, you play the same song, how can you go wrong, you know? <laughs> So it was easy, you know, I wasn't too worried about it, but as soon as I showed up and we rehearsed for an hour and a half, I said, okay, we have this, we have something here, it's, it's not going to be bad, so. So, in terms of like extreme vocals, what's like Chuck Schuldiner your like biggest influence and, and, and the one that you sort of like mimicked first before you developed your own voice or, or how did the like vocal development happen for you? Well, with Chuck Schuldiner, I never, I mean... He, his vocals were the first death metal vocals that I heard and I liked, but they didn't. He didn't stay my favorite. I think his his vocals on spiritual healing are really sick, really brutal. But John Tardy and um, Glenn Benton and like those guys, I was like, wow, this shit is sick, and I love it. it you know, my parents hated it. Um, I I just I just fell in love with metal. I fell in love with death metal. I. 
I, I didn't listen to too much power metal or anything, but the vocalist, you know, that inspired me the most was Brett Hoffman okay. from Malevolent Creation. And um, I just loved his lyrics. I, I love everything he, he's ever done. And um, that's where I pretty much found my comfortable style because I'm not, a, I don't like guttural. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't like the, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't like that kind of stuff. To I like some somewhere in the middle, and you know Chuck Schuldiner and all those and John Tardy are somewhere in a higher register. You know, like suffocation, like uh, Frank Mullen and, and Chris Barnes from Cannibal Cor or Six Feet Under Cannibal Corpse. They, I liked what they were doing, but I, I, I liked the fact that with Deicide and Malevolent Creation and Death, you can under you could understand what the lyrics were. Okay, you so know that's I mean? like very important for Very you. important, yeah. So I try not to, you know, I like to, used to like to read the lyric sheets of all the gory lyrics and all that stuff, but, <laughs> you know, unless you have the lyric sheet, you didn't know what was going on. So I, although I like those bands like Suffocation and, and Cannibal Corpse and all that, I, I liked the style more of Brett Hoffman where, and even Glenn Danz, or not Glenn Danza, Glenn Benton, where the lyrics were intelligible. I mean, when he goes, Manson! Like, you know, he's saying yeah. Charles, you know, so I just um, developed kind of my own style. I did a, a, did a death metal record on my own, but um, I tried to use my own style of, of death metal vocals. I tried to combine rock and death metal, but I didn't want to do melodic death metal like, like in flames or something like that. I wanted it to be old school death metal with cl some clean vocals and then my own style of, of death metal vocals. But on this tour, I'm trying to get the songs to sound like they, they should, which um, only Brett Hoffman, you know, knew how they should sound the first four albums. So um, I'm just trying to pay homage to his voice and his legacy and, and throw a little bit of my own, my own you know, style in there, if there is any. <laughs> so obviously... You've been hard with like CK uh, when it comes to like more rock stuff and now like more extreme top stuff. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that those go in a way also hand in hand? So if you become a better like clean singer, it also helps with the screaming. Yeah, because live, um, when I do 96 Bitter Beings and all the CKY stuff, when I did that live, I did a lot of death metal screaming just because it was part of the live show. Yeah. And, um, so I always had that in me. When you're singing in front of an audience in a rock band, they don't mind it if every once in a while you go off on a little death metal tangent with your voice. Yeah. You know? And um, so I guess I got a lot of practice with that, doing that, because rock and, rock and death metal are very similar. They're very similar. The, the playing and... Uh, death metal you have to be a little bit sharper and more focused but also when you're playing hard rock you have to have the melodies and be tight with with the drummer and they're, but they're very similar they're playing in bands it's all rock and roll to me I mean not to quote that song it's all rock and roll to me <laughs> but yeah I mean it is it is it's just, it isn't that much different so what kind of like early memories do you have when it comes to like the first full proper tours that you did? Were you ready as a vocalist to do like many shows in a row or, or was it more like a party experience for you? It was both. I was flying by the seat of my pants. I didn't know. I was always afraid of touring because I'm not a traveler. You know, I was always uncomfortable touring. I, I'm uncomfortable touring now, but I enjoy it. Um, and I know that it's necessary to tour when you're in a band. When you release an album, you ha it's something that you have to do. I like being in the studio, but when you release an album, you have to go and promote it. So um, I just flew by the seat of my pants. I got on the bus and we played a show and played, you know, um, on the Volcom stage at the Warp Tour. And every night just got up there and, and did it and never really had many problems. I think in the whole time that I've been doing this, I think I've had four or five shows where I was like, okay, my voice is kind of fucked up today. But it was it's never been a huge dilemma. But you know, on this tour there was that second day and I was like, what's wrong with my voice? I can't even talk. 
And the guys were like, whoa, you're your you're second show and you're already, like, can't talk. I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then everybody started coming up with all these different ways to get my voice back, like all these drinks, like tea and ginger and honey and all that stuff. And then we went to the pharmacy and I sprayed this that stuff. And um, I was back the next day. It was really, really, it was, I think it was Brett. Brett helped me. Brett's been helping us on this tour. It's really, really, it's really interesting how much more I believe in the afterlife because he's he's watching what we're doing and he's helping out. I think that he had a lot to do with the fact that we're almost done this tour and I can still I can still belt it out and we could, we're all getting along and we're all friends and and it's it's just working out really well. So, I believe in I believe you're up there buddy and you're watching us. <laughs> so in terms of like warming up for shows, do you have like a warm up that you follow or do you just go up on stage I and just... perform? And and what about like after show? Do you have some kind of like cool off routine when it comes to like voice or Nope. Nope. Never not had. at all. Did did I ever? No. Never. <laughs> I don't I don't warm up except unless you count like we might do a sound check every we didn't do a, we don't do a lot of sound checks but we might have we, whenever we do a sound check i get to play a song and like warm up a little bit i guess but now i just get up there and do it because the adrenaline is what what makes it work you know um being on the stage is the most important part obviously of touring but it makes it all worth it and even if it's like an hour and a half or a small amount of time the adrenaline rush that you get when you're up there with an audience it it cancels any physical ailments you might have like for instance if you have to take a, if you have to go to the bathroom before a show and it, you don't have enough time and you get up on stage that feeling of having to go to the bathroom goes away at least for me like if I if my leg hurts for something for some reason or I my or my shoulder is bothering me from from head banging or something, as soon as I get up on stage, it disappears because the adrenaline is kind of like a painkiller. So I don't do warm ups because a I'm afraid I'll be warming up and that's when <laughs> I would fuck up my voice. So I just get up there and that's that. So obviously you've released during your career a lot of albums with different bands. Are there like some specific albums that you could pinpoint where you felt that you've taken like a big step forward as a singer? Um, I think Carver City, uh, CKY's Carver City was a big leap in um, my vocal abilities. The album that came before that answer can be found was that was a different story because the album got erased by the engineer who forgot to back it up on a separate drive. So that album got completely erased and we had to piece it back together like a jigsaw puzzle. And the vocals that were on there that were left weren't the best takes. So we had to sit there and literally put pieces of words together. And we did it in Sony studios. The record company didn't know about it. We flew to Sony studios in New York and we're all sitting there trying to piece this album back together after that asshole completely destroyed it and all that. So, thanks, buddy. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so there's Carver City. Um, and I, on IDR, I didn't think I did really good on vocals. I listened to that. I'm like, eh. the first album, too. I'm still trying to get comfortable with singing but carver city i think we spent a lot of time on the vocals and i was getting more of a range i could do higher and i could do lower and i really like the vocals on that album a lot i like the vocals on the new 96 bitter beings records the uh, campaign and synergy restored i think those are some of my best singing and then on um the world under blood tactical album i think my my death metal vocals are good on there because that's like that was like the only album that demonstrated my my style of of uh, extreme vocals. So, so why do you think that those like ninety six Peter Beings albums are like good for you? Did you do something different with them? I mm, I didn't do anything different. I just 
I just prepared more. I guess I prepared myself more for it. I, I had been, of course, listening to Carver City is the only CKY album I really listened to and because I, I love the melodies on there and I just took what I learned from that album and got to move it, move forward on the 96 records. Of course, Carver City came out in 2009 and then um, Campaign, you know, I hadn't done any any albums except for an acoustic record, which I'm not that happy with, but people like it. I don't think... My singing was that good on there, but I had some personal issues going on at that time, so that that uh, that acoustic record didn't turn out exactly how I wanted. I think there should have been drums on it, but I think I was just competing with myself on the '96 Bitter Beings records because I knew how good I could do, how how good I could sound if I really tried hard because of Carver City. So I didn't want to go down from from how well Carver City was done and just keep improving. Plus singing in the car, man. If you want to be a singer, sing in the car. You don't even have to go anywhere. Sometimes I drive up to the Circle K, the store by my house, and just sit in the parking lot and sing. So, so what was the first song that you sing in a car? Oh, I, anything. Anything that, that comes up, anything that I feel like listening to. A lot of the malevolence creation stuff I turn on and sing along to that and you know I think that I do it more than I th think I do it okay. <laughs> so so it happens basically naturally more I think I do it more than I th thought I did um, yeah so I guess that could be considered practice but um because I do it a lot but you know being in a, in a house living in a house with a family and all that you can't go around the house screaming all the time so because cops get called and the family gets annoyed with it but um yeah i mean basically that's it i don't know where this power comes from where i'm i'm i mean knock on wood hopefully the rest of the tour will go fine but <laughs> i just have this voice that that i've had for 25 years that just i don't know I, i'm able to control it in a way that you know, Brett Hoffman used to be able to control it, you know, really long screams and just not, not, oh, it's really hard to explain. I don't know. I don't know why my voice doesn't go to shit. It just doesn't. I don't know why I don't warm up. I don't know why I don't, like, do have, like, some kind of regimen that I do after a show. It's just nothing. I just do it. <laughs> That's that. I mean, it's really not very. Right? It's not complicated at all. I just go up. There's a time to do it. All right, let's do it. So you are an old school extreme metal fan. So what's your opinion about like vocalists copying the microphone when they're performing? Do you have any kind of like opinion for that? Um, like copying the microphone when they're singing like. I've never heard of that. You don't people know that do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like what? Like this? They cop the microphone and then you scream through that. What good it, does it, that do? It gives a different like voice out. To what make it lower? Yeah, it goes. A I've lower. never heard of that in my life. And an engineer will. <laughs> I've never heard of that in my life. I didn't know that that was any kind of a technique to hold the microphone to change the voice. Obviously, I can't do that. No, we play the guitar. Obviously. Right. So yeah, I I don't think I would do that. I don't think I would do anything that involved any kind of cheating or. Or maybe it's not cheating. I don't know. I've just never heard of that. So it's the same for using backing tracks for you that you wouldn't ever use it for vocals, for example. Um, no, not that I'd be against using uh, backing tracks for like uh, atmospheric stuff. Yeah, but that, you know, that makes sense. But also. for vocals, like if you're not there, if someone's singing and they're not there, I don't know what what the point of that is you might as well just play the album and stand up on stage <laughs> i don't understand that stand but in you the know audience. what it, 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 it is good for some bands i understand like you can't have like some if you're a four-piece band or a three-piece band and your albums have a lot of backup vocals and you want to fill out that sound i'm not totally against having like some harmonies yeah. but if you're like kiss or motley Crue, and you go up there and the lead vocals are all fake then I have a problem with that. Everybody should have a problem with that. 
So what were like your parents' reactions when they heard first time you screaming your lungs out? Do you remember? They, my parents were supportive. They just kind of, they watched from afar. They wanted to see where this was going to go. Um, they knew I was obsessed with music. They wanted me, I think the thing that bothered me the most about my parents, my, the early support of my parents is that, that they kept telling me, you have to have a backup plan. You have to have a backup plan. You have to have a backup plan. But plan that, that's B. what parents say. That's what they say. And I understand that. But like when you, there's people that want to do, there's people that want to do things and there's people that know they're going to do them. Yeah. And I always knew that I was going to do this in some way. I was going to, I knew I was going to get a record deal. I knew I was going to, I just knew it. Because if, if you want something that bad, most people don't want things that bad. They're not willing to put in the work. But if you put in the work and you, and you even overwork yourself. I became a workaholic when it came to music. And I, you know, we made contacts as a band. We started to get everything around and we started these projects. If you want to do something, no matter what it is, be a doctor, be a movie star, whatever, you learn how to insinuate yourself into con connecting with people that are already in that business. And you become a part of their lives, and then it's just, it's, it's a lot of work. And, um, but my parents, of course, after it started to become successful for me, they they started to claim, oh, we were always supportive. <laughs> you know? But, uh, you know, they were scared. I think they had every right to be scared. But that's what bothered me about, about that is you gotta have a plan B. It's like, I don't want a plan B. Plan B is to... <coughs> if, if you would ask from like a top athlete, like Lionel Messi or Ronaldo, if they had a plan B for their like life, they would absolutely say no. No. Only goal was to be the best, for, like, soccer player in the world and that, that right. was their only aim for the life. Right. And I don't even consider it risky to go full 100% because when you have divided attention, something's not getting 100% of your attention. If I had a plan B, that means that I would have to use time for whatever my plan B was instead of using that time to do to music. To be even better with music. Right. So I had to put 110% into music and nothing into a plan B. And I, I didn't think it was risky because there's plenty of different jobs you can do in music and still be able to play music. You know, so I always thought maybe I'd start my own record company, maybe I would uh, try to be a producer someday or, you know, something like that. But I, I was too obsessed with it to, to ever doubt that it wasn't going to happen. This is a question that most likely has been asked from you like millions of times, but is there like any kind of advice that you would like to give to like young metal vocalist who is just about to start their journey? Anything that pops up into your mind? Metal vocalists? Yeah, I or, or vocalist in general. I would say you better be honest with yourself because if, if you record something, the first thing you have to say, and this is what my problem was, when I did poor vocal performances on some of the recordings that I've done, I was so unsure, I knew it was bad, but I went around asking everybody their opinion. What do you think of this? Is this good? And it got to the point where they're like, Darren, it's fine. Just leave it alone. But nobody told me it was good, like it was outstanding. And I knew that it, the, the, the material that I worked on that was no good, I knew it sucked. Deep down inside, I knew it sucked. So right off the bat, skip that step. If you record something, you have to ask yourself, would I like this if it wasn't me? Would anybody else like this if they knew it wasn't me? You know what I'm saying? So you have to be honest with yourself and be able to, if you're trying to emulate a, voc a vocalist or you're um, inspired by another vocalist and you want to achieve that kind of, you know, development of your, of your voice and everything, you have to be honest with, am I good at this? And if I'm not, I have to keep practicing and getting better. And practicing is the key to it. You keep practicing, make tapes of yourself singing so you can listen back to it. Um, don't listen to people that are family and friends that are like, you're amazing, you're amazing. Because that's what you see on those idol shows. You know, my son has the best voice ever, you know, and they take, they think that, 
that they're getting good advice from their parents, that, you know, and their family and stuff. But then they go in there and they're horrible. And, you know, Simon Cowell and all of them, they say, why do you think that anybody would want to listen to you do that? And it sounds really harsh, but it's true. It's like you haven't, you're not putting in the time. Some people, you know, everybody has a talent, but I think that if you're trying to be a singer or um, be in music or anything and you don't have the talent for it, I always believe that you can create it and come up with it as, as, and take it as far as it will go. But I think I don't think people spend enough time get, um, giving themselves the experience that they need. I think that people uh, will start singing or start, start playing guitar and then automatically think, okay, well, I did that. Now I'm ready to do the next thing. And that's not true. It takes years. Years. Thanks a lot.